If you were born in the 80s or 90s, you may not be prepared for the real world. Oh my, there's a generational gap here. What did you say, five, there's like five, five generations. generations. Born in 73, so where does that put me? Probably Gen X. Gen X. Yeah, well that's the me generation. Yeah. What do you think of millennials? Coddled, entitled? Yes, I think so. Really? I do. The uh, narcissistic baby boomers, the most greedy, most selfish generation that has ever existed. We've all heard these labels before and heard about all the different traits and characteristics and differences between these groups. One problem though, generational differences aren't really a thing. And we need to stop using these labels like right now. Welcome to the Learner Lab podcast. I'm Trevor Reagan. Each episode, we dig into one topic that can help you and your people get better at getting better. This week, we're looking at rethinking generational labels. I got my hands on a 177 page report released by the NASEM. Hey, ChatGPT, what's the NASEM? NASEM stands for the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Its members are top experts in their respective fields, often including Nobel laureates and other highly recognized scholars and practitioners. Using AI on a podcast classic millennial behavior. <laughs> so anyways, the National Academies of Sciences, they assemble a committee, they pour over all the research about generational labels and differences, and then they publish this book, this 177 page report. Here's a quote directly from the report. Categorizing workers with generational labels like baby boomer or millennial to define their needs and behaviors is not supported by research and cannot adequately inform workplace management decisions. Huh, you can't get more crystal clear than that. So I hope you're starting to see the issue here. The science is saying one thing, yet we're still using these generational labels all the time. We use them to change the way we train people, hire people. We hire consultants, we buy books and workshops teaching us different leadership strategies and how to treat the different generations. But like the report says, these differences don't exist. So let's get to the bottom of this. I was able to track down two of the experts that were cited in the report. Uh, my name is David Costanza. I'm an associate professor of organizational sciences and psychology at the George Washington University. Uh, my name is Court Rudolph and I am a professor of psychology at Wayne State University. David and Court are gonna help us dig into three big things. First, the issues with the original research around generational labels and differences, the problems that using these generational labels cause in the workplace, and then most importantly, the solution. How do we fix this? How do we change this? Typically, generations are defined in like 20 year spans. So we have silent generation, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z. We've all heard the names before. So the idea is these groups each have a set of values, traits, and behaviors that make them more alike than the other groups. And a couple academics started researching it and honestly kind of made book deals and promotional videos and basically sold this idea and it got ingrained before we had a chance to look at the research. So like the late 90s, early 2000s, there were a few academics who were really pushing this stuff all the way up until around 2008. A couple of pop press books came out that I don't wanna give any credit to because I don't wanna give any credit to them. Uh, and that kind of cemented it. And then people said, hey, wait a minute, we started looking at it and then we started to see what a problem it is. And then the more I dug into the research, the more I realized that most of the research was poorly done statistics were wrong, the data didn't answer the questions, uh, the theory didn't back up the, uh, the science. And by the time I was done, my conclusion is basically everything that's in the media, in the pop press, on Twitter and Instagram and everything else about it uh, is just wrong. Uh, the labels don't mean anything. They don't designate any differences among people. Uh, they're not correlated with anything. They don't account for any variance. I mean, I just on and on and on and on. It, the gap couldn't be any bigger. The reality is that these groups um, don't exist in an objective way. Uh, they exist because we've constructed them to exist. I would say most lay people think that generations matter a whole lot, and in reality, they don't. On the academic side, I think we're starting to kind of extinguish it, but the practitioner, pop press, few research people are just 
they're just they they're locked onto it. And just to kind of let you know that cycle is that a couple of the people who are probably most responsible, the academics are probably most responsible for putting forth this idea, have stopped talking about it. The whole generational concept and labels have been dropped by the people who promoted it. So now what we have left are pop press and marketers. And here's where like the original researchers got confused. Yes, there might be differences between people in those groups. The problem is the differences are not caused by the generation they're in. It's caused by something else. And more times than not, it's what they call an age effect or period effect. Yeah, so an age effect is or differences among people based on how old you are, your, your physical maturity, your psychological maturity, your life stage. Uh, you know, an example of an age effect is as people get older, they're more likely to vote. And that's a pure age effect. It doesn't make a difference if you, if you got older in the 20s or the 50s or the 80s or today, older people vote more. Pure age effect. This sort of idea of just growth and development over time makes it so that younger people are much different in terms of, you know, knowledge and skills and abilities, but also things like attitudes and values and just like approaches to life um, that come with experience and time. Um, than people who are relatively older than them, right? So, I mean, those sorts of, like, actual true developmental differences manifest in a variety of different ways. So imagine we have people in each one of these groups, and we give them a survey about maybe their job satisfaction. Yes, we might see differences between each group. Maybe the older generations are more satisfied with their job and the younger generations are less satisfied. So we say, yeah, look, there's a difference between the generations. Wrong. We're tricked. It's actually more of an age effect. Yes, 20-year-olds and 40-year-olds and 60-year-olds and 80-year-olds, if you line them up in a room and ask them questions, you're going to get different answers. Uh, but it has nothing to do with being what generation they're in. And, and so that's where it kind of fell down was equating these, these apparent and sometimes real differences uh, with being caused by the fact that you were 20 when World War II happened. And that made you the way you are now because of that thing that happened back then. And that, no evidence for that at all. So what you get is this effect. It looks like a generational thing because I can look at it and go, oh, that's a young person. Oh, that's an old person. They're in different generations. They're different, but it, it's not. And that, that's where the that's where the problem is, is because it's seemingly apparent, but the underlying cause is not. A period effect is an event or shift in society that affects pretty much everybody. So COVID could be an example, um, the introduction of the internet or smartphones. There's actually research that shows that millennials who join the army now show more pride in their service than baby boomers and Gen Xers did when they joined. Is this a generational difference? Nope. It ends up that since 9-11, everybody shows more pride in their service. So this was an event that occurs that creates a change. We look at it as generational, but it has more to do with the period effect. Another term that we need to understand is cohort. A cohort is a particular group of people, hard stop. So obviously cohorts can come in all shapes and sizes. It could be a big one, like the country you're from, or even the state that you're in, the city that you're in, the type of job that you have, um, where your parents are from. Like there's so many different ways to create different cohorts. What the early generations researchers got wrong is defining the cohort as a generation, which is an age by period interaction. So your particular age at a particular point in time, and therefore you are impacted by this event. At the same time, at the same actual literal time, if you're of a different age, you're not impacted. And so you get this interaction, right? This A times P interaction, which creates the cohort. The problem is, is that when we look at a person now, there's no way to separate out how much of your characteristic is attributable to any of those things because I can't go back in time and change you. And if I do what most of the researchers did, which was look at this data cross-sectionally, I could look at you and say, all right, your generation, whatever. Um, someone who's 20 years older than you is generation, a different generation. Um, I ask you some questions like, how satisfied are you with your job? Uh, the older person's more satisfied. And I go, boom, generational differences, younger people are unsatisfied with their jobs. 
and of course the confound there is age because older people have uh, had a chance to leave the jobs they don't like. Uh, so if you're in a job and you don't like it, you quit. And over time, you figure out what you want to do. You also find a job that you like that pays well. You get committed to the organization. And so, gee, shocker, when you're 50 or 55, uh, you're more satisfied and more committed to your organization. That's not a generational thing. That's an age effect. And then some of that isn't even due to like individual differences in, in like career trajectories or something like that. It's more like time and place, right? And so like... You know, if you have uh, a not so good job in a really good job market and you're young, which means you might be more likely to be single, or if you're married, you maybe don't have like a bunch of kids to move around the country, then you're more likely to hop around, right? And so it's about like mobility that's facilitated through life situations. And so the easy way to explain that really complicated story is, well, it's just these kids these days and, and they want to move around and they want to hop jobs and, and whatever. Um but the fact of the matter is that, like, you know, when you're young and you're not tied down to one place because of, you know, other burdens, uh, you know, from your family or from, you know, whatever, uh, tenure is a pretty good predictor of tenure. So the longer you've been with an organization, the longer you're likely to be with that organization, like, moving forward. So, I mean, if you're within the first few years of a job, you're more likely to change anyways. So, so the issue with traditional generational research is it's actually impossible to really separate out the age effect, the period effect, and say that any of these differences are actually caused by the generation the people are in. It has more to do with how old they are when you measure them and what's happening in society at that particular time. This approach is also unfair. Think about people who grew up in the 40s and 50s. We like to put them all in a box and say they have a shared set of characteristics, traits, behaviors, and a, a way of looking at the world. But that doesn't take into account all the other factors that could shape them, where they're from, their background, how much money they have, color of their skin. Obviously, all of these factors are going to influence different outcomes in their lives. And to just use this broad generational label, this broad stroke, doesn't really account for the nuance. Now, more recently, people have found the limitations of that traditional approach to research. And when they do it more accurately, they find no significant actual differences between the generations that impact any sort of performance or outcomes in the workplace. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, okay, I guess this is making sense and the researchers are pretty definitive, but we see the differences. I see them all the time. And I'm not saying that people aren't different. They are different. We're saying the differences are not caused by generations. They're caused by other factors. More times than not, it's the age or the period. And so I, I was get, given a talk to, a, again, a tech conference. Uh, and the person who brought me in afterwards said, wow, that was really interesting. And I didn't, didn't really think about their, it's not really generational. It's really these characteristics. But, but my assistant, she, has, she does this behavior X. And it's so stereotypical of this group of whatever generation. And it's just really frustrating to me. And I said, well, what's frustrating about it? Well, and then she told a little story. Well, the behavior prevents her from doing X, Y, and Z. And I said, are there other people in your organization who do that same behavior? That's just as frustrating. And she said, well, yeah. And I said, how old are they? And 20, 30, 40 years older. And I said, well, the problem is the behavior. The problem isn't that it's this generational thing, but you, you hear the generational label and you associate that characteristic with it, and then everything just flows from it. So with these labels comes all sorts of stereotypes, mostly negative, that the baby boomers are stubborn, can't and won't change, that millennials are lazy and entitled. The really funny thing? You get the same criticisms of youth and the same criticisms of old age historically um, going back centuries. God, your generation, you're so squishy. The whole generation is completely mashed out. They just don't care. That's one of the problems of your generation. Take the average young fella today. He won't get out and work the way we used to when I started to sell. Let's play a quick game. I'm going to read you some quotes about millennials and try to guess what they all have in common. They think they know everything and are always quite sure about it. Young people are high-minded because they haven't been humbled by life. A few of my 35-year-old friends are just now leaving their parents' nest. 
They're doing the kinds of things that our society used to expect of 25 year olds. Okay, so what do you think? What do all those quotes have in common? What they have in common is none of them are about millennials. One of them is 100 years old, one of them is 2000 years old, and one is 90 years old. This is a pattern that we see throughout history. It has nothing to do with generational differences. It's just how we think about people that are younger than us. Okay, so we showed that the original research was flawed that created these generational differences that don't really exist. But from that flawed research comes the generational labels that are sort of entrenched in society. The new and better research shows the generational differences don't really exist, but the labels remain. Now, okay, maybe this doesn't seem like a big deal. Like, it's kind of harmless to put people into these categories and use these labels. But the truth is, if you really dig into it, this is actually really, really problematic, especially in the workplace. First of all, this is a big waste of time, money, and resources. Different groups all the time invest in books, consultants, workshops, really trying to change the way they train and hire for different generations. Now, the issue is we're investing this time and energy trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. And look, sometimes we do see an issue in the workplace. We see differences in people. But then the, the issue with the traditional consultants and books and workshops is they're addressing the wrong root cause of the problem. In my opinion, the biggest issue here, the biggest problem with these labels is the stereotypes. That we have these ideas about the different traits and behaviors of each generation, and we use them to put people in boxes. And in a way, these labels can be extremely limiting. It can really hold people back from learning, growing, and getting better, especially if we're changing the way we treat people based off these artificial labels. Once you say the label, and you may have noticed I've studiously avoided using any of the labels, uh, that activates a set of characteristics. And not surprisingly, some of the research has shown that the characteristics that get activated are not positive. And that starts to hint at what the issue is, which is if I say, oh, that person is a member of generation fill in the blank, and there's a bunch of stereotypical characteristics that are incorrectly associated with that person, then everything else that follows from those stereotypes, like the youngest generation coming in, they're not committed to their organization. So either there's something wrong with them, which is usually the immediate response, or we need to do something to help them be committed. Like we need to give them more flexibility or more autonomy or that, right? And so what it leads to is the, whether it's an organization making a, a unnecessary investment, whether it's a manager trying to treat workers of different ages differently, whether it's a HR person uh, hiring or not hiring someone based on kind of expected stereotypes. There's all sorts of negative downstream ramifications that are purely associated with that label. The idea that people should be treated or led or motivated or developed differently because they have, they're of different generations, I just think is so problematic. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I do, I'll give talks and I'll say, okay, here's a label. What do you think about, you know, what's, what words come to mind? And, you know, you talk about the, the youngest group of people and it's like, they want meaningful work and you know they 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 want to work by themselves and they seek autonomy and all these types of things and i was giving a, a talk to a bunch of lawyers it was really funny a bunch of, of 500 lawyers and they, they threw these labels out there and i said autonomy boy that's a really interesting one right because that's a really strong stereotypical characteristic associated with this new generation i said okay so i'm gonna ask you a question right you're all lawyers you're all professionals please raise your hand if you don't want more autonomy in your job crickets right Please raise your hand if you don't want more independence, you don't want more chance to set your own schedule, if you don't want more developmental opportunities and motivational opportunities from your firms. Silence. It's not. <laughs> and yet just 10 seconds earlier, they were saying, oh, these kids are, you know, all they want is autonomy and blah, blah, blah. So that's, that gets at the challenges. And if, if, a, if a CEO or a manager or, or someone, you know, doing HR, doing employee development, for instance, thinks, oh, well, this group of people has these sets of characteristics, so I need to design a training program or an educational program or a developmental program for them. No, you need to develop a, a training or educational developmental program for your employees who need that thing.
Not only is this approach wasteful, it can also create some legal issues. Right now in the workplace, depending on who you read and like what labels people put on these things, there's four or five different generations like in the workplace, right? And so um, the sort of common trope is that it's like millennials that are causing all the problems in the workplace. And, and that's, you know, maybe a bit dated at this point, but let's consider for a fact that if you go by the pew cutoffs, the, the, the youngest, or I guess the oldest millennials at this point are, are, are over 40 years old, because I think the original cutoff there was like the night was like 1980. Right. And so what that means technically is that if you're going to, you know, pan someone at work for being a millennial, they're, they're technically covered by the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And I, and I bring that up because that, that piece of legislation says that if you're 40 years old, you're protected against employment discrimination in a variety of ways in terms of things like hiring and firing and promotion and, and salary and all kinds of sort of general personnel classifications. And so the, the, the risk here is that if you start to attribute things to, to generational membership, uh, you start to participate uh, maybe unknowingly in some form of age-based discrimination. Okay, so where are we at? We said the generational differences actually don't exist, but we're using these labels all the time and we talked about the problems that that can cause. So what's the fix? What's the solution? Just get rid of the label and say, this employee is exhibiting this behavior which is non-productive. Fix it, train them, reward them, whatever you have to do. Uh, and it doesn't make a difference what the rest of it is. Like he said, it's good to focus on the specific individual, their strengths and weaknesses, the things that we need to address for that particular person. And so figure out what the, what the characteristic is, what the trait is, what the skill is. Um, you know, when you think about developing your employees, figure out how to develop your employees, what skills you want, where do you want them to go? What, what potential do they have and where do you want them to achieve? And then make that available to them because that's gonna get all of your employees more skillful, more trained, more interested, more motivated, more committed. You know, we want to encourage people to stop thinking categorically about age and to stop differentiating people on the basis of like artificial age categories. There's a, a wide variety of different ways that we can sort of leverage the benefits of a multi-age workforce that doesn't require us to sit down and bifurcate ages into, into generational groups. It's more about how can we get people of different ages to work well together and especially get knowledge transfer between older and younger employees to really build up uh, kind of that you know internal knowledge base that represents a competitive advantage. We need to stop squeezing people into these artificial boxes. Instead, get rid of the labels, address the individual, address the skills and behaviors you want to see, and treat everyone as a learner. And to me, that's how this research connects to our bigger message. I know that on the surface, maybe an episode about generational labels doesn't really make sense for the Learner Lab podcast. But when we take a step back, when we zoom out, I hope we've really shown the connection here. Yes, we're all different. We have different personalities, strengths and weaknesses, but we're human. We have a brain, which means we can change and grow and adapt. Let's stop limiting people's opportunities and growth with labels that have really no basis at all. I'd like to give a big shout out to David and Cork. Thank you so much for your fantastic work and sharing it in a way that we can understand it. We're gonna link to all the resources below if you wanna check them out. Thank you so much for learning with us. You can go to our website, thelearnerlab.com for more resources on better learning and leadership. We'll be back next week with another episode.